and and let me bring in uh, Adina Friedman. Uh, Adina, thank you so much for taking time to be here. We wanted a someone who was in the CEO, CEO job who had been in the CFO job, which you were at Carlisle. So it, it, it's really great to have you here. Yeah, no, it's great to be here. Yeah, I actually had the chance to be the CFO both at NASDAQ and Carlisle. So um, two different environments and it was, uh, it was, you know, it's a great experience. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, so start with the data point that uh, uh, Anil was making. It's not just the ERP anymore. Uh, um, it's an explosion of data. How do you deal with that? And how do you find the signal in all the noise? Well, I think it's a great question. And it is a great question for a CFO forum, because when I think about how we're organized, here at NASDAQ and how we organize the CFO role at Carlisle. So um, really the CFO had, had from a corporate data perspective, really had the, the, the roll up of all that information to turn it into a business metrics that allowed us to make the right decisions. And so, um, and it's become obviously more and more complex because on the one hand, more and more of your data gets unlocked because you have the chance to um, move it into an infrastructure that allows you to manipulate it and find find signals and find outcomes. But on the other hand, can be kind of overwhelming because it's all there, but how do you get it and harness it in a way that actually works for the company? So um, at Carlisle, actually, I, I was one of the CFOs who where the CIO reported into me and it allowed, allowed us both to sit together and say, okay, how are we gonna modernize the, the technology to support an evolving C CFO role and take the company public because we were taking Carl out public at the same time, um, and it was uh, it was a lot of a lot of my time was actually spent on systems, a lot of it, and in, in terms of really thinking through the corporate systems. And then at Nasdaq, we're you know we've been a public company for a while, so we had more well formed systems, but we recently migrated to Workday for HR and finance. And so now we're saying, okay, what can we do with that in, in addition to the Salesforce data, in addition to the billing data, et cetera, to get more intelligence out of our, our information. Adina, did you have a technology background as well as a finance background? So I actually uh, started at NASDAQ in 1993 as in the, in the, on the business side, writing product plans for our trading business, trading products. Um, and then became a product manager of um, several trading and data products, and then became the head of our data products division, um, and then became head of strategy and then CFO. So uh, because of the business experience I had um, running our data products and, and really honestly partnering very closely with tech on the trading and data, data systems that I was in, in really involved in, I, I became very familiar with technology, but I'm not a technologist myself. Yeah, and how would you advise advise replicating that experience for other CFOs who need the technological literacy to make this work? Well, I think one of the great things about CFOs generally is they're very analytical <laughs> um, and they like to kind of unpack process and repack it, right? So that's frankly a core skill set that you find in a lot of CFOs. And when you think about what you really have to do as CFO is you have to unpack a process, a data process and then try to figure out, okay, where does that data originate? How does it flow through the system? How does it end up where I need it to be in order, and how do I organize it in order to be able to draw conclusions from it? So I think a lot of the skill sets that CFOs have are quite relevant to being the, the person who harnesses the data within, within an organization. Um, so it's not so much that you need to know that it's in Java, you know, or, you know, or, or you don't need to know SQL. You have, might have people on your team who know SQL, but you have to know how to kind of unpack a process and repack it up in a way that gets you a different conclusion. And, um, and I, I think that's, um, that's why the CFO has become such an critical role. And then on the ESG side, Alan, I think yeah, that's a great, a great segue because, because today, I would say the IR director is suddenly being thrown into this role of having to gather up all this ESG data and provide it to investors. And they, again, are great communicators. Oftentimes, they often come, come with a financial background, but it's really the CFO who sits next to the IR director and says, okay, how are we going to pull this together? So in, in NASDAQ, we have someone in our finance team who's responsible for our internal ESG program um, because of the fact she knows where all the data is. <laughs> yeah. She knows how to pull it all together. And, and then we actually provide, we have, we have a, a system called One Report that we use, but we also 
um, provide to our listed companies and yeah, any public company who where it, it basically rolls the data up into a single platform and allows you to report it once and then we send it out in all the formats it needs to go to in order to reach the, the ratings agencies and, and the investors. So um, so that's a new a new technology that has to be developed internally. And, and obviously much more data than anyone has ever had to deal with before, but a lot of it is junk data. I, is, is that just part of the core core competency of the CFO to be able to uh, to determine what's valuable and what isn't? Yeah, I mean, parsing through what uh, one, uh, one internal uh, system, we actually call it C3PO because we like Star Wars at NASDAQ, <laughs> um, but that our CFO has created is basically a data intelligence engine. And so she's got, you know, she's integrated into Salesforce, she's integrated into Workday, HR, Workday Finance, she's integrated into our billing system, and we're not, frankly, we're not as well oiled a machine as we probably sh could be or should be. And so she's having to map data together, make sure like a customer name and one, one, one business unit, Salesforce might be different than a customer name in a different sales, Salesforce instance that could be different than what's in our billing system. So the mapping of the data and then, and then coming, as you said, which data elements are actually important um, to what, what are, so you have to start with what questions are you trying to answer? What decisions are you trying to make? Then you look at all the data and you have to make sure that you're parsing through it to say, let's stay to the, true to the North Star and make sure we're really focusing on these questions and these answers and let all the other data go for a while. And as you start to ask yourself more questions and need more answers, you can pull in more data. But that's how we've, that's how we've approached the problem. It's interesting. I've seen now a couple of reports that suggest the application of uh, AI and machine learning kind of paused during the pandemic. Oh, Actually, interesting. Yeah, even some indications it went down a little bit. Uh, does that make sense to you? I mean, you think that's just the, because you had other things you had to deal with or? We, we didn't have that issue, um, but I think there are probably two reasons that could be. I hadn't read about that. Um, one would just be prioritization, as you said. So if you're here, you know, machine learning, as you, I was, we've talked about this before, machine learning takes a lot of teaching. Right? So there's a lot of time you need to take to teach a system to understand what it's reading and find, and draw the right conclusions. And you, you train it and you train it and you train it and train it. And then, and then it starts to reach its own conclusions, right? Maybe during the pandemic, you chose to take those people and apply them to a more immediate need that the company had. That could be, um, maybe you realize, frankly, that all of the models kind of broke in COVID. So like what, what, what you expected to be a normal course of business that could that a trained system could reach conclusions on, maybe it couldn't because the data was so different. Um, yeah. Those are, could be reasons why they may have paused their activities. But we, we've been very, very engaged. So where we apply machine learning is on our market surveillance systems and our trade surveillance systems for our clients, um, where we try to root out manipulative behavior um, and and train the system to find behaviors that we couldn't find through the human eye, as well as to uh, train it to be better at, at identifying false positives. So that uh, that continued for us. We didn't have to pause that. I, I want to ask the group to. Uh, I want to open it up to questions from the group in, in just a minute here. But if you could use the chat, uh, if there are questions or or comments or observations you have for uh, Adina, just throw them into the chat. I'm I'm keeping an eye on it. But I do want to ask you, Adina, uh, uh, you made the decision to require NASDAQ listed companies to demonstrate board diversity, uh, which I guess is a kind of ESG metric. Um, and there's been some pushback on that, particularly from the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. I wonder what your reaction to that has been. Sure. Well, so just to level set what the proposal is, is first and foremost to provide transparency around the composition of the board from a diversity perspective. And it's based on how a board, a board member would self-identify, would provide that information to the management team, and the management team would then populate an anonymized table that provides the composition of the board from a diversity perspective. That's the, that's the primary uh, portion of the proposal. And then the second portion of the proposal is um, some goals that we've set for the companies listed on NASDAQ to try to reach within the next four years to have at least one woman and one underrepresented minority or LGBTQ member on the board. But the only obligation is that if you're not able to um, have 
you know, essentially one of one and one, then you would explain why not. So maybe you've chosen a different form of diversity. Maybe you uh, have decided to prioritize other other skill sets on the board, but you would just explain to your investors why you're not why you're not at that state. And um, and the controversy is is you know I think that there's been some view that that is close to a mandate, which we would disagree with. You know, it's it's not a hard mandate. It's a market-led solution that's really focused on transparency. Um, and then I think that, um, and so, you know, we've obviously been managing through those comments, but when you look at the record, because these the, a proposal like this has to go to the SEC and get approved by the SEC since we're a self-regulatory organization, um, that and it's a listing requirement, then if you look at the record, 85% of all the comments that have come in have been positive. Um, every, you know, almost every positive letter has been from in the investment community or the corporate community um, and, and as well as advocacy groups. But I think that we've had a lot of great support from the investment community and the corporate community. So we feel very good about the record and we've explained all of our you know, we've had, a, there's a 44 page document that explains our rationale and, and answers any comments. So right now we're just waiting for the SEC to do their final review. I have a question from Howard Ungerleiter. Howard, you want to unmute and uh, if it's a problem. Hey, sure. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, Alan, happy to, happy to unmute it. Dina, good to see you. Um, yeah, it's good to see you. you know, I, I just uh, put my support for the, for your uh, board disclosure. Uh, comment. I think that was very. I, I appreciate your leadership, uh, and I think it's the right direction for the for the country and for uh, you know corporate corporate America and frankly corporate world. But specifically, you talked about ESG. I'm just wondering, are you thinking about or evolving any plans on your for your listed companies for ESG disclosures? And then if not, you know, there's so many different indices out there and organizations. I'd just be interested in your view of as you look at the landscape. You know, maybe not picking one, but you know, who are the top two or three that you think uh, are going to gain more traction? Sure. Well, first of all, Howard, thanks for the support on the board diversity in initiative. I um, really appreciate that. Um, with regard to issue reporting, I think that there's going to be a fair amount of government um, involvement in that discussion in the next coming two to four years. I think we should start by looking at Europe and understand what is coming in Europe. So the regulators are just now there. I would say they're probably two steps ahead of the US. Um, they've they've uh, organized themselves within the EU. They've come to um, put forth essentially a series of questions and an analysis to evaluate mandatory ESG reporting for European listed companies. And so I think it's a good, uh, it's a very important thing for us to pay a lot of attention to because if I were a US company that had operations outside of the US, um, and I were looking at a regime where I knew that some sort of mandatory reporting was coming, wouldn't I want to have one set of reporting obligations and not two, three, four, five, right? So to the extent we can start to shape and understand the European landscape, how much of that can then be applied to the US on a rational business-like way, then we should, we should kind of evaluate that. But I think we should assume that the government's going to take a pretty active role here. And so therefore, NASDAQ, um, beyond the board diversity initiative, which we do believe because we do oversee governance of public companies, that is something that we have a particular uh, expertise in. I think that um, we'll be there to advocate for our companies um, on behalf of, you know, behalf of those listed companies in terms of how the government's going to take a look. So I hopefully that answers the first yeah. question. And on the indices, um, I mean, there the one that we we obviously are a public company too. So when we look at which which of the rating agencies do we find do, do the best job of really understanding us, I have to admit I you know, I shouldn't give a winner or a loser, but I have to say I think Sustainalytics does a pretty good job. Um, I think some of them are more of a black box that are really hard to navigate, and and that actually is a frustration as a public company. And I also think ultimately that will be to their detriment. So mm -hmm. hopefully hopefully the more the more um, transparent agencies will win out. Uh, uh, Howard, thank you. Adina, thank you. Uh, I, I, I should have asked my fault, Howard, to identify your company, but I suppose most of these people know uh, Howard's with Dow, um, and we appreciate you being part of this. Uh, Robert Simmons also has a question. Robert, if you want to unmute and ask it yourself, if not, I'll do it for you. Hey, thanks, Alan. Uh, Adina, I just had a couple broad, a broad question about cryptocurrency and 
what your view is on that. And uh, you, so you can answer that any way you'd like. But also specifically, I'm, I'm curious what NASDAQ is thinking about potentially blockchain technology as a way to uh, facilitate T plus zero settlement. Okay, sure. Um, so with regard to crypto, let's just say that there are two iterations of crypto, the decentralized crypto currencies, and then the more centralized approaches to digital currencies. I'll call them digital currencies as opposed to crypto. Um, obviously, both leveraging the same underlying blockchain technology, but um, one being community driven, community created, the other being centrally created potentially by a central bank or or, or a central organization wanting to use the technology to for commerce. So I think that frankly, both have a role to play. Um, and I think you are seeing more and more um, institutional investors and other organizations that are more than what I'll call the traditional financial industry becoming more engaged in the decentralized community-based crypto markets. Um, but they are, there are a lot of pain points. They're very, they, you know, if you look at the evolution of the crypto marketplaces and how you look at an end-to-end, -end, how does it work as a retail investor? How does it work as an institutional investor trying to get and buy and sell crypto? Tons of friction, a lot of friction in the system today. So I think that it's got a lot of room to mature technologically um, from a process perspective. And over over time, there'll probably be more regulatory over, oversight um, of the space, which you know will help it mature. I my view, my belief is unusually kind of counterintuitive, which is I actually think regulation could catalyze the the, the, mar the crypto market more than. Um, slow it down just because I think it'll open it up to more participation. Um, in terms of the centralized digital currencies, I think that they will take longer to develop. But um, it, the, if there's a you know if there's a gov coin that ever gets developed, I think it will, will change commerce. I mean, I think it'll streamline a lot of bank to bank and a lot of uh, commercial commercial transactions. So I think it'll be pretty interesting to watch that too. But it'll take longer. And on the blockchain in, itself um, and uh, settling of trades, I think it'll be a long time before you get to T0 settlement in US equities. It's just, you know, we trade 3 billion, you know, we trade actually, you know, 17 billion shares a day. We process three and a half billion orders a day just within NASDAQ and we're obviously not the whole market. Um, in options we're trading, we're, we're processing 40 to 60 billion messages a day. The blockchain is not quite ready for that. <laughs> um, yeah. But I also would say that uh, going from T plus two to T plus one is, is very likely. Going from T plus one to T plus zero changes every element of the technology that underpins the markets. So it'll uh, take a while. Adina, we have two more questions and they're not simple questions and you have about 30 seconds to answer I'm them. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not good <laughs> at answering throw, quickly. I apologize. Uh, uh, Mario, Mario Rizzo asks if, if cyber and privacy protection is is keeping pace with a rapidly changing environment. And Barris Oren asks, uh, how do you get ESG goals deployed to a, a broader organization? Okay, so on cyber, um, uh, cyber is one of those things where the, the best you can do is use the best technology that's available and constantly iterate and constantly evolve. And that's what we do. Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's obviously the most concerning risk that any company that has a big economic impact has, and um, it's one that we take extremely seriously, and we don't compete with each other around cyber, and we collaborate and we communicate with each other around cyber, because we all know that it underpins the, the foundations and the, and the trust in the market. So that's an area where we are very, very active and, and collaborative, and we work closely with the government. Um, I can't speak as to whether it's keeping base, but the one thing I would say is that when you think about it from like cyber criminals, you know, who, whether they're using the banking system to money, you know, launder money or perpetrate fraud, they're constantly using the latest technology that's available to them. Always criminals are, they don't have any rules. They can use whatever technology comes along. So if you're a bank, then it's really, really important that you also get to use the best technology that's available to protect yourself. And yet, as a highly regulated organization, the banks often have a harder time implementing machine learning. And, and, if, and so that's an area that I think regulation needs to evolve to support technology and the ability to, to be innovative 
around protecting uh, protecting the banks and protecting against criminals. And that's, that's an area that we're actively involved in from a technology perspective. On the last question you had- I, I, You know what I'm gonna do, Adina? Yes. Here, that's a perfect transition. Okay. Uh, ES, it was a question about ESG and ESG is in fact the topic of our next CFO collaborative on August 11th. So Barris, if you come back and join us on August 11th, we will do a deep dive uh, uh, then and-, and get Okay, it, that it sounds good. <laughs> Adina, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. You really covered a lot of ground very quickly and with, with great skill, and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Great. Thank you all very much.